Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Sudeshwar Tamilsena. <laughs> and through the years, I've heard so many stories about his life and about the adventure of growing up in a place where a village was self-contained, where a village made everything that it needed. And in a sense, he manifested through his childhood narrative the living reality of that which Gandhi holds as our ideal. That we all need to be economically and personally and psychologically in a place of Swaraj. But he was cast out by his own father who said, I've taught you all I can and was sent into the realm of the electric light, was sent into the big city of Kathmandu, and built, after studies of Varanasi, a remarkable department of tantric studies at Kathmandu University, and served as the authoritative resource for virtually every scholar who has attempted to learn about and to write about tantra. The list is, is really quite long. And one of those scholars said, come to Germany. And when I asked, well, why didn't you stay in Germany? He said, I don't really like being treated like another. I love that little moment that we had together. And in California, we're all others <laughs> to one another. And what he has done is publish in the past couple of years some remarkable interpretive work about rethreading the universe, which is actually the definition of Tantra. And just as Gandhi suggested that we need to spin before we weave, what he's now undertaking is the spinning of reeling back the stuff of the tradition of Tantra that we have. And this includes not only the philosophical, but quite literally the material. And so many texts that he has himself personally gathered, but has testified still remain in Kathmandu. Uh, these things need to be studied, they need to be gathered, they need to be edited, they need to be translated. And I think that we've had very fertile ground for encouragement about the interpretive skills amongst our philosophers, both in India and here elsewhere in the world. And what he promised today was to share his studies of Sri Vidya as given to him in Varanasi and in other places as part of his exam. So we're bringing him back to his schoolboy days. Welcome, Mr. Nishra. Oh, Professor of Religious Studies at San Diego State University. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, how am I going to look at that intro? <laughs> and I come here without any paper. That's, that's double embarrassing. <laughs> I partly decided to come without paper for the sake of authenticity. Not, la not that uh, we as scholars lack words, but with papers we have a map. What would we do if we do not have a territory already mapped out? And it also comes either through a deep appreciation of uh, what Professor Krishna Chappell and other friends here are doing, or my own willingness to be in this grueling uh, transformation to the object for everybody to analyze. I have opened myself to be studied by scholars. And I have taught many scholars East and West. It implies being bored and openness to be an object and not always 
and ors to be the subject. And that comes also with my conviction that there are certain things that a subject needs to have to open himself. Like in our uh, uh, traditions, we have uh, Lord Hanuman willing to open his own chest. And, and that did not, in any account, uh, make him weak. That only showed his unconditional surrender to what he considered the truth. So here comes wanting to be part of this whole conservation effort of a tradition. Because everyone here, Professor Chapel is always selective in inviting people who are great scholars, but also the, those who have great empathy. So this emphatic space is what has allowed me to just be open and, and be analyzed. So with that, what I want to take you to is a journey of my childhood. And what we conserve in these efforts of cultural conservations because first of all, for the West, it, the Western culture has never ever faced any threat of annihilation, a cultural annihilation. Only maybe due to the West, all the indigenous cultures and languages and philosophies and the ways of life have faced annihilation. So, the mode of conservation also has come from the West, the emphatic West. The conservation efforts come, first of all, with uh, uh, artifacts. So that come with our museums and doing archaeology. We do archaeology of knowledge. And it also comes with the conservation of manuscripts, microfilming. <laughs> when I was already an undergraduate student in Nepal, because I could read some uh, classical scripts, so I was hired for the microfilming project, uh, the German conservation project. Uh, as an undergrad, uh, to get some uh, even tiny bit of incentive was a lot. And I lived through that moment of excitement of, of uh, how much effort is being paid towards conservation. And slowly our friends from within culture mimic, my friend talked about mimesis. The Western efforts of cultural conservation. I have a couple of friends who actually are techies and whatever hundred dollars, two hundred dollars they can save, they go and look for some manuscripts and if some pundits are not willing to just, you know, like they are holding on to it and they give some incentives, so they are willing to have those manuscripts microfilmed. And then we will translate them and we'll analyze them and, and, and I, I admire this effort. So what is lacking in these efforts is a, a, an absence of subjectivity, a lack of experience, uh, a lack of uh, life, if you may, because artifacts are not alive. When you have a deity in a museum, there's a big difference between a deity in a temple and a deity in a museum. When we are doing Indology, we are creating another museum of knowledge. And knowledge needs to be lived. Experiences, we do not conserve experiences in books. Experiences are conserved through direct experience. For that, we need human subjects. And a teacher's role it's in conserving knowledge, not merely in writing books or copying, but actually copying a human being. 
having another photocopy or a real another human being where that experience, not the book, experience is transmitted, experience lives through. And that is where everything falls apart. That is where crisis comes. Many of my good friends and top scholars in Europe who have lived their life with great love to this culture, with great empathy. When I talk with them, they really acknowledge what I'm talking about. They have lived 50 years of their life in conservation efforts. And when I say, look, you are turning into another museum. <laughs> and when they started it, it was not an intent just to make it another museum. They really loved these things. And it was not like some kind of job, although sometimes it happened to have a job. How do these teachers impart their knowledge? I was like 16. Um, everything starts with a dream. Coming from a Pandit tradition, learning some Panini or you know Sanskrit grammar is is given in family. That doesn't mean that uh, there is some kind of a special attention you are going to get from real teachers. Um, I in in this dream, I, I used to have nightmares, and in this one too, I was going through my nightmares. School is like narrow, dark street, and in a corner there small light, teeming light, and then there was one hermit sitting. And he looks at me and says, where are you lost? You're supposed to come. The class has already started. <laughs> <laughs> um, a couple of days back, I used to have like a play friend who used to just hang out, uh, Rohini, and he says, you know, there is one guy who can tell you the future. Let's go to this future tailor. And I'm like, I was a hardcore materialist already by then. And Nepal is like swept by these communist ideas. And so I kind of sort of follow just to, for the sake of making fun of this, this guy, <laughs> you know, future teller, whatever he is. And uh, I, as soon as we entered the room, I just felt like crippled. My legs trembled because that that was the guy I had seen in my dream. Oh. And uh, um, he was telling whatever bunch of stories. And he looks at me and uh, he asks, what do you want? Uh, I say, I don't know, really. <laughs> uh, OK, then, then come tomorrow alone. That was one first. Uh, encounter to a teacher. Uh, his name was Prima Chaitanya. And then I kind of started going, hanging out, not to any serious teaching. He's treating me like his son. And I'm like, when are you going to start teaching? He said, one day, you know, just like, come and play with him. No, no teaching going on. About a week later, maybe two weeks later, I'm going through another nightmare in which the, the, where I was living was swept with fire. Everything was burning. And I'm running away for, to save. And the fire is changing after fire. Fire is spreading wherever I go. I rush into Pashupati temple. And then I run through the <coughs> corner. And up there in a room, I go there. And then the fire didn't come there. And I woke up. It was 4 in the morning. I had been to Pashupati temple in my three, four stay, uh, years of stay in Kathmandu one time just to see what it is like, but never actually felt like going again. And that day, I just felt like I should go. And it was still morning when I reached there, and up in that corner, that exact wall, behind that wall was a room, and I could see through the window, uh, there was a monk, uh, uh, teaching for students. I snuck in. I loved the conversation happening there. And I thought that uh, he is, uh, uh, you know, like one of those God's guys. And I thought, let me make fun of him. So why not I kind of 
hang out, hold on to it. So when his class uh, finished, he asked me, what are you here for? And I said, I don't believe in God. That was my first thing. And then he said, he looked at, I didn't believe that. But you are a monk. But no, I'm interested in realizing who I am. And you know, like I was 16, and I never heard a question like uh, any anything like that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And the conversation went on to him inviting me for lunch, and then he eventually said, "Okay, if you come at five in the morning, I will teach you. <clears throat> five in the morning, I will have to actually walk for one hour for that." Ramananda Brahmachari taught me exactly after that day, since the next day, constantly for 12 years. Every single day, more or less, when I was in Benares, he was in Benares. When I was in Delhi, he was in Delhi. When I was in Kathmandu, he was in Kathmandu. I studied Navanaya, I studied uh, Advaita Vedanta, and I studied Mimamsa. And I studied Abhinava Gupta. He made me what I am. And there is this Prem Chetan who is my Tantric Guru. Right? Next day I go. I thought I found a teacher for you. How is he doing? <laughs> <laughs> and I always had this mystical masters kind of things, you know, it's too many things happening and I just had to contextualize and he says, please master, initiate me. Now I'm I totally believe in I totally believe. Just give me mantra. And he gave me uh, Durga. We started with Durga. <laughs> and then you have to just uh, do a Purasharana, means recite. It's just like 900,000 times and then come up. <laughs> <laughs> so, which I did. Only to realize. I thought now some miraculous things are going to start happening in my life, you know, uh, um, uh, like uh, uh, some financial crisis is going to go away or whatever, you know, not, nothing like that is happening. Only that he says, okay, well, you are almost there, you have to do this more, almost there, you have to do that more. I did not know what parampara, tradition, it was, because there is no naming for these traditions. The titles didn't mean anything. So the rigorous tantric practice, rigorous shakta practice in Nepal was not somewhat separated from Bengal or Varanasi and had a remnant of Kashmir. So that practice which he started uh, the, with the Durga practice was just to test uh, the field whether I was kind of okay or not. So then the next course in our tradition was a Kali practice, and which preserves what is now lost in Kashmir. And I'm telling you authentically, and you can always come and check the manuals from our tradition. <clears throat> and after that comes Bala and Panchadashi and Shodashi, all these uh, practices within Sri Vidya. And for every practice, you have to do a Buddha Sharana. It's not overnight. There is no workshop for that. <laughs> and teachers never trust you. Or anyway, that's the way I felt. They are always testing. And the tasks they give could be fasting to the fasting of words, silence. But sometimes, it's going and spending a lot of time alone. Uh, mostly up in mountain, or sometimes one or two nights also up in a tree, <laughs> in caves, cremation ground particularly. And while these experiences or the grueling practices are going on, I always thought, what is the point of these books now? But no other step 
would be taught without the consent of my Vedanta or Nyaya masters. Uh, Shastriji mentioned uh, Harirama Shastri and Rajeshwar Shastri David, the top Nayayikas of early 20th century. Rajeshwar Shastri David taught Padma Prasad Bhattrai, who won all India Shastrartha three times, Padma Prasad Bhattrai. Both his disciples taught me, Navyanaya. And so these Nayayikas outside were Tantrikas inside. <laughs> these Vedantins outside were Tantrikas inside. And the practice in Nepal culminated with Kubjika, a series of Kubjika practices. Now I feel like I've done these mantras, I've read these books, and I've gone through Vedanta masters, I should be ready. Sometimes the test could be really not acceptable. Like uh, I was married when I was 25, and my Guruji, Ramananda Brahmachari, said, what are you doing? You are supposed to go and stay in ashram. And I stayed for three months in ashram and said, what are you doing? You got married and then just, I told you, go stay in ashram and then you didn't even ask me? You taught, I taught you Nyaya so much? <laughs> <laughs> and after three months I went back and, and my wife was not uh, happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> Why are these things happening? Why are these teachers doing the things that um, elicit fear, that elicit also anger, that elicit grief. We had to grow up and we had to be able to get to that maturity. And we had to be able to tap into every day meditation could go a minimum of three hours to maximum of 10 hours. So at, at least for 12, uh, 12 years, every day, a minimum of three hours, I have maintained the course just to meditate and the study is separate. This is just to be a student. Because my dream was to be an Acharya. <laughs> because the first you get is Samaya initiation. And then you get two types of initiations. If you want to be a putraka, go run your family, or sadhaka, be an initiate, be a hermit, and whatever, you get your deity, and then you have your belongings, you go there. But you cannot be an acharya without actually fathoming the tradition. And what is there to actually get when you become an acharya? Just a word that your teacher says. You are now an Acharya, that's it. So everything, every struggle was to hear from the mouth of your teacher. Everybody in the tradition had to prove to our teachers. Shankara Chaitanya Bharati, as you can see, Khandana Khanda Khadya, some of course Shastriji knows, of uh, uh, the Sharada commentary, if you see the topmost commentary written in um, in this 20th century, comes from my Guruji. So every single master from whatever the generations, whenever they have become Acharya, they have not only been through practice, lived practice, but also have composed Shastras. Oftentimes those could be manuals, but oftentimes those could also be philosophical texts. The practice of Sri Chakra was not about having the recognition of the goddess for us anymore. We were like an enthusiast. So the Dasha Avarana, ten Avaranas in the Sri Chakra started with the Charvaka Darsana in the front, the Bhupura. Going all the way to Advaita in the Bindu, Shankara Advaita Vedanta in the Bindu. What is the Shiva Ardhavada? Shiva Ardhavada is the totality because you can't have the Sri Yantra without the totality. 
this is in the materialistic philosophies, dualistic philosophies, are all possible philosophies. And uh, the manual connects all the way back to Vidyaranya, uh, but could go earlier than Vidyaranya, just so that it's not some kind of uh, cooked up formula today. I was uh, uh, feeling miserable because I already got married when my teacher said go get, become a good householder and be a teacher. I already started teaching but I'm still not a child. I'm, I could be a professor, I even started a department. But I'm not an Acharya. This, this <coughs> haunts, this incompleteness. I'm doing, doing all these things. Then uh, when I offered uh, a small Shastra, Tantra Gavara, to my Guruji's feet, Shankara Chaitanya Bharati, and he touched my forehead and said, Acharya, mm -hmm. this is it. I would like my good friend to come here to um, sing the first 25. This is like 300 verses. Uh, only the 25 verses that my teacher said I could claim to be an Acharya after death. So if you see no melody working, we never had a prep. I just couldn't it together. <laughs> Doya doya pada tvandam, doya doya vivarajitam, nityam chinmatra vistaram, turya tita mupasmahe, vishro tirna vishamai, shatrim satta rupini, akrama krama sanskara, parasam virajate, anuttaram nirvikalpam, Chin Marichi Vidrim Vitam, Paricheda Parichedo, Padi Veda Vivarjitam, Yathalo Kaparichedo, Vishayakya Prakashate, Saitanyam Bhati Vishwatma, Manakaro Toyasrita, Sarvati Tam Sarvamayam, Aprameyam Soyam Pratam, Chiti matram param dhama, nana sabde niruchyate, satta kriya kara kancha, vari vaspa himatmata, taranta paramam tattam, yatra sarvam pratishtitam, sanko chatma vikasatma, kramaru jakriya mayam, shakti chakram chidanabo, gajante yasya vistare. Naiva maya vino maya, naivorna purna navitaha, salilam nahimat innam, jagatta dvat chidatmakam, parinamo vivartova, yatkin chidapika tatam, soyam pulla sate nitya, maya kaya nijechaya, krama srita pyakramava, jagadakara vikraha, Kulam chitradi vigyanam yatha sankhyam vikalpyate tanmayatvad bhava vargaha shakta sanmatra vistaraha branti shopnadi vigyane satta sapekshata sama samastya cheta sakritam vyashtya vagatha vedataha sadasadva yate chamba sattam chittam apekshate Nirapeksha shiva vastha, navastha kalpite nyatha, karya karanam bhavena, vyaktatam yati chinmaya, loke rathadi vyaparo, vinna vayava sangrahe, shiva sahava masritya, sarvadishthana matyata, deshakalayo yatra, vayanta chitra varjitaha, Spanda Spanda Mayugapade Gavara Sarva Samba Vacha Vacha Kadoi Vidyam Mano Mulam Kramasritam Adasat Kam Mahamaya Spara Kamesha Kalpita Shivo Brahmati Jivakya Soprakasa Maya Dhani Jaja Jaja Vivedena Nana Stane Suvyapakaha Sajiva prana samparkad, 
भिन्नाधिष्ठान व्यंजिता बद्ध पिंडाभिमान मुक्त मोह प्रमाणता अत्र विद्वेशरा भाति निर्विकंपे महारदे तदंतांतांतहृद भाति कामेशरा स्वयं नित्या शिव से चिन्मात्रा न घूति क्षण वर्जिता सर्वा भाषा प्यना भाषा युगनद स्वयं प्रभा बीजांकुरतया शाक्त विव्यमुल सनात्मक बीजांकुरतया सर्व एकीकृतवतिष्ठते अश्वत्थम बीजात शून्यमात्रा महारदा अक्षयाश्रितकला पुनः सूते चराचर तुरीयंबा पंचक्रीत भाषा रक्तिर्मर्शन बीजावस्थापन स्वात्म लापन स्पंदन श्रिय सृष्टि स्थितिलयाख्या भाषा कम प्रकाशिता अहमाक्रांत संकोच महोदय विलासिनी संविदेव पुरा प्राणे भाषते कुल संक्रमे ब्रह्मांडे हंस रूपेण जीवे कुटिल कुंडली Now I have few more minutes. Um, now comes a bigger issue of a deep cultural conservation, because what does it mean to actually conserve uh, any culture? Um, as I said earlier. Um, do Buddhists have the experiences of the Buddha? Because now Buddha is gone 2,500 years ago. And you are sitting in a monastery or you go to one workshop and hear emptiness and whatever the cooked up idea you have about empty. And if you feel that, <laughs> you see that you have gotten some kind of Buddha experience. And when it doesn't work in your life, you go to another workshop. <laughs> <laughs> so, for all the traditionalists, not doing some pure logic, because the objective of Vatsyayan, the objective of Gautama, was never to do logic for the sake of logic. It was for Apavarga. It was for moksha. And with that spirit, how have these people been able to, at least to be able to claim that they have kept those experiences alive? What devices the traditions applied, the cultures applied, in order to conserve, not the book, but actually what is inside the book? How to live that from one human being to another human being? And how do we know that uh, uh, we going through so much of cultural upheaval, actually I was not even able to uh, continue my task without uh, um, um, being thrashed by these Maoists and all, and I left Nepal not because I had such odds to just to come and have amazing life in the West because I could have actually gone to Germany as an undergraduate student when some of the professors were deeply impressed that I was working on these uh, manuscripts with them. I did not have to go to Banaras. I did not have to go back to Nepal and start a department for Tantric studies. There is one thing, some people might say there is nothing of value, that's, I'm not talking to them, but those people who see the value in it, let's have these mantras repeated as many times, and then have the masses who can actually have these mantras, have mass production of the Sri Yantras, we can do that. Because for mass production, you do not need lived experiences. 
how can we produce human beings who are willing to live this experience and continue to write this, not to summarize only, but after living for 25 years of everyday practice, whatever comes to them have the guts to say that this moment, at this moment, the experience I have gotten is not my subjective experience. But this is that very flow, the continuity of the experience that has been transmitted to me through the generations of Matsyendranatha, Adi Shankara, Abhinav Gupta. That is where our focus has to be. That is where we will have our students who are not only aware of the uh, beauty of books which is there, but experience is more significant, more crucial. But the, when we go to this stream of experience and then this is a bookish knowledge, that is where the pundits were scared that this uh, uh, anybody could just come and claim. We had to pass the test of Dasha Darshan, ten, 10 philosophies, Navarnath, Navarnath idea was originally from nine different teachers. Only when nine teachers stamp you, your main acharya is going to say, you are acharya now. <laughs> or otherwise, you don't have to be an acharya, you can just, and you would get whatever miraculous cities or all that. That's a, that's a whole different, that's not ever the goal of the Pandita. Panditas are not simply bookish people. Panditas conserve the tradition. Panditas live the tradition. They sacrifice everything they have so that the tradition survives. They sacrifice every success they could have in life so that they can live as their guru. They continue to simulate, mimic the presence, the physical presence of their teacher. Why this issue of conservation comes so crucial in, in my consciousness right now is in last May, I lost my mother. I went to Nepal and she was in good health and all, and I said, I'm gonna go. She asked, when do you wanna go? And she told me, wait till this day. She gave me the day, wait till this day. And I said, why? I know we have a big party going on. I'm gonna give a party. And then that day she collapsed. I lost my mother. And three months later, the human being, the divine human being, who picked me from the gutter and taught me for like 14 years, or at least 12 years uninterruptedly, Ramananda Brahmachari, who had become Ramananda Giri from the Sankara's order, he passed away. He was everything to me. And in this chain comes Sunanda. When I first met her, her glow and her ease, I met in Krishabal had given her and Shastri ji on house. I went there in the mornings, they were working, editing the book. And I look at her and you look like my mother. You, you look so much like motherly. Can I call you mom? And she said, yes, I'll call you son. <laughs> Shastri ji, do you remember that? So, These people did not die of the external threat. When particularly I'm talking to people, cultural insiders, external threat in my interpretation is uh, like uh, somebody shooting, that's external threat. Like uh, somebody knocking you off the cliff, that's external threat like a flood coming, earthquake, those are external threats. All these people I loved were not victims of external threat. The body or the system is not always threatened by outside. I know some of you, if you seriously hear what I'm saying, would have maybe difficulty to accept it. The body or the system dies because of the internal threat. Great traditions have developed amazing techniques to conserve experiences. That needs 
selfless work of sadhakas for a long time. But when the organ is diseased, what happens with the cancer? That the body thinks that these are their own cells. It gets tricked into accepting what is not inside as inside, what is not part of its body as its body. And that cancer, they are also called the radicals. So these radicals are eating up every single civilization today, every great tradition today. And if I'm threatened of the annihilation of the great culture, I'm more concerned from within culture itself than from any of the Aurangzeb imagination level outside. What I'm not saying that never happened, but these things cannot, because I can produce a vote bank of 10,000 people. Actually, when in Nepal, I was forced to involve in some kind of politics because my guru said, without having some kind of politics, you can't do anything here. I have to be part of the system. What I have realized based on personal experience is creating 100,000 people, masses, to say yes, is much easier than to create one human being who will sustain this tradition. And that is what is in threat today. And that is what these great many scholars and sadhakas and siddhas can sort out how to conserve this culture, how to conserve this tradition. Thank you so much.